so good afternoon everyone and thank you for your patience so this is one of the last topics of the day we're going to be talking about advanced ovarian and cervical cancer and as you can see from the global can 2018 data both cervical and ovarian cancer made up uh, 100 uh, 132000 cases which constituted 22.7% of all female cancers diagnosed. Uh, coming to ovarian cancer, it's a tough disease for those who've been treating it. We know that 80% will relapse. They will receive multiple lines of treatment. This will be uh, accompanied by increasing toxicity and decreasing periods of remission. Finally, the patient lands up with bowel obstruction and it's quite an untidy death. Uh, the role of surgery at relapse is uncertain. There are two studies that have addressed this issue. We have different choices of treatment at platinum sensitive and resistant relapse, but continuously platinum sensitivity is being redefined. The incorporation of molecular targeted therapies is now a big thing, and we now know how to incorporate bevacizumab. And more recently, with the great data available on PARP inhibitors, we are starting to use these as well. So surgery at relapse was addressed by the dex desktop trial and they calculated what they called an AGA score in platinum sensitive disease. And they found a significant improvement in progression free survival following surgery. However, the GOG213 uh, was a contradictory study. This was done by Coleman and his colleagues and it was a sub study with bevacizumab and there was no difference or significant benefit in progression free survival. There were differences, however, between the two trials, which can account for the different results, mainly that there was a greater bevacizumab use in the GOG study. Now, we know that platinum-free interval correlates with great treatment response and prognosis, and as, as the platinum-free interval increases, so does the overall survival response rate and PFS. Refractory has been traditionally defined as those that are progressing during platinum therapy. These patients live less than six months. Those that are resistant relapse within six months of first line platinum, they live about a year. And then you have the platinum sensitive, which give you a gap of more than six months since the plat last platinum therapy, and they go on to live between two and three years. But there has been an evolution of subgroups and we have a new landscape now. And these are the GCIG consensus statements. Because of increasing use of non-platinum and biological agents, we prefer to look at ovarian cancer with treatment-free intervals. So T TFIP is treatment-free interval from last platinum dose. TFINP is from the last non-platinum therapy and TF. LB is from the last biological therapy. We have additional criteria we look at. We look at BRCA state status now. We look at the outcome of prior surgery. Patient reported symptoms are very important. And with platinum resistance, we are looking at early symptomatic progression. What is the data for combinations in platinum sensitive disease? It was clearly shown that combinations were superior to a single agent platinum and a median progression-free survival between 8 and 12 months was expected. In this setting, bevacizumab has also been studied, the OCEANS and GOG trial again, and both showed an improved progression-free survival, though you do not get an overall survival benefit. In my mind, the best use of bevacizumab in a resource-constrained country is really a platinum resistance setting where you have the Aurelia trial, which showed a good improvement in PFS, not only that, quality of life and overall survival. And it's also been demonstrated that single agent BEV can act actually control ascites and effusions and can provide great palliative benefit. And now with the biological uh, biosimilars, the price has come down considerably. The PARPs have hit the market in a big, huge way. We have three that are available for ovarian cancer in this setting olaparib, niraparib, and rucaparib. And you can see all across, if you look at the progression-free survival, it is a consistent hazard ratio of 0.3, indicating a 70% risk reduction in, in uh, uh, relapse. And this is seen mainly among BRCA, germline BRCA mutated patients. There is a benefit in non-BRCA as well, but this is of a lower magnitude. The overall survival data are not yet mature for most of the studies, 
but there has been a benefit in solo too. There have been important differences and in the clinic when we think of starting a maintenance therapy which is pretty standard now in ovarian cancer, we discuss it with most of our patients and for those who can't afford either BEV or either PARP, there are a lot of fellow oncologists that may not come out with it outright but I'm telling you we do put them on oral endoxan as a maintenance. So a lot of our, us are doing that especially in patients who have responded very dramatically because we know these are likely to be BRCA-like and BRCA-mutated tumors. So if you look at the maintenance schedule and timing for the bevacizumab, you have to give it uh, uh, up front with the chemo and then continue it as maintenance. PARP, you can decide after a response to uh, a few cycles of platinum. PARP only is useful in non-mucinous tumors. BEV has been used in all. And uh, uh, both BEV trials looked at first recurrence. For PARP, they've had a number of previous regimens. And we don't have overall survival data on PARP, but we know that with bevacizumab, you get an improvement in PFS, OS in very, very selected groups, that to a small magnitude of two or three months. So there are various algorithms and uh, surgery wherever feasible after talking to your uh, surgical oncologist or gynae surgeon. Look at the tumor biology, look at the treatment free interval, look at the symptoms, look at what the patient can do and then decide whether you need to do a platinum or not. If platinum is the best option, then it's a combination. If it is non-platinum, think of adding bevacizumab. And wherever platinum is the best option, you do want to test for BRCA and platinum sensitive patients. The price has come down quite reasonably now. And then you can decide on maintenance PAP, yes or no. In platinum resistant, the situation is quite different. Symptom control and quality of life take over. These patients are fatigued, they have a lot of abdominal symptoms, they have bloating, they have constipation, they have indigestion, they can't eat, they have nausea and vomiting due to small bulls, could be subacute obstruction as well, and disease stabilization then becomes your main goal. And when you choose non-platinum drugs, you have a variety of options, including topotecan, gemcitabine, liposomal docs. But like I said, BEV is a promising drug in this situation and can actually give you a good platinum uh, uh, progression-free survival. Both Olaparib and Rucaparib have been approved as monotherapy in this, this group. And this year, ESMO saw a plethora of studies for the platinum-resistant group. And these in, included uh, combinations of Sidaranib, which is a VEGF inhibitor, and Olaparib. This also included other drugs such as ATR inhibitors, but this all in early stages as yet. Shifting gears to cervical cancer, it is a disease of the poor. Most of the disease burden is in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, including India. De novo metastatic cervical cancer is uncommon. However, a lot of women, almost half, will develop recurrent or metastatic disease within two years of completing initial treatment. The chemotherapy story has been rather disappointing with cervical cancer. The phase three studies started way back in 1985 and you barely got survival uh, of seven to eight months in this group. Then Tobotican and cis combination was shown to have a slight benefit and uh, over cis platinum alone and you got three extra months. It was in 2009 that VEGF inhibitors were used and uh, this I think was presented in the ASCO plenary and uh, no, sorry, I'll come to that later. So this study showed that cis cisplatin and paclitaxel was pretty comparable to cisplatin and topotecan and was favored as a combination because of less toxicity. Topotecan is an extremely toxic drug. So cisplatin is considered the most active cytotoxic, but the duration of response is disappointing. Cispacli is pre preferred now as and a better toxicity profile. And carbopacli is an alternative when patients especially have received cisplatin along with radiation previously. You would prefer to use carboplatin. However, they're cisplatin naive. Please don't give carboplatin because there's a survival benefit with cisplatin. What I was alluding to earlier was in 2013 at the ASCO plenary, the drug bevacizumab was uh, added to the combination and showed a 3.7 month 
overall survival in the metastatic recurrence setting over chemotherapy alone. The same plenary had Dr. Shastri talk about visual astic acid screening for cervical cancer. And he demonstrated, and I found it really ironical because his intervention costs 100 rupees and uh, was able to bring down the mortality of cervical cancer in country like, countries like ours by close to 30%. And here was a drug which would cost about 8, 10 lakhs of rupees and which would add, uh, not with great quality of life, three and a half months to a patient with metastatic cervical cancer. It was quite funny because one presentation followed the other. Uh, prognostic factors in advanced cervical cancer are important when you are in the clinic deciding whether to give chemo and add bevacizumab or not. You need to assess the performance status, pelvic disease, look at the disease-free interval since chemo, radiation, prior platinum, and you quickly calculate the score and you know where your patient stands. So if your score is low, you will get a response in 40%. If your score is, is intermediate, you'll get a response in one out of three. And if it is a high-risk patient, don't even bother because your response rates are going to be 14%. So this is a great prognostic model that you can use very practically in the clinic and it doesn't really require any fancy blood tests. So this is the story of uh, immunotherapy. I usually don't recommend it unless it's a very affording patient and I'm pushed against the wall and the patient is still in a good general condition. The response rates, as you can see with Pembro, have been between 12 to 17 percent. Nevertheless, there are many ongoing trials where it is now being added to bevacizumab. There is a rationale for synergism between these two drugs, and perhaps that's why this is being explored. So this is a brief algorithm. When you have a persistent <coughs> locally recurrent metastatic patient, you, uh, a recurrent patient, you've got to assess through imaging whether there are metastases. If not, you need to improve the comorbidities, correct the malnutrition. I usually don't recommend exenteration because the morbidity is unbelievable and most of our Indian patients don't accept it. However, if metastasis is present, you need to figure out whether it's worth doing chemo or not. And you need to look at stage 4B in a way Whereas if the PS is really bad for even three, you consider hospice care. But if it is somewhere in between, you need to optimize your patient, get the nutrition going, normalize the renal function. A lot of these are in obstruction. You may need to do a PCN, make them feel better, get them to eat, control their neuropathic pain and tumor pain, maybe use pain blocks. And once they're in a decent performance status, then you could consider chemotherapy with or without bevacizumab. Once they relapse, it's usually a very sad state and you're supposed to test for PDL1 and do immunotherapy, but I th don't think this is a cost-effective measure for most of our patients who greatly benefit from pain control and supportive care. So in conclusion, cervical cancer is still a burden in terms of incidence and mortality, especially in countries like ours. Chemo radiation is the standard of care for most patients as they have locally advanced disease. Cisplatin and Pakli is the standard for metastatic and recurrent disease with an option of carbo replacing cis. The addition to BEV has improved the overall survival, albeit in a very uh, normal and moderate way. And uh, it can be considered the new standard of care only for selected patients. Immunotherapy is being explored as the next frontier. Thank you.